All right. Well, you can turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, and we'll start off there tonight as we uh, take a look at this idea of breaking the chains of moral sin. And uh, this has been an interesting subject, and I've had, I've had good responses, actually, from people. I was not sure how people would respond to it. I've had really good responses and good questions and good thoughts from it. And, um, and really, there's nothing wrong with asking questions or, or trying to figure things out. <clears throat> That's what Christianity is about, is growth and figure things out and growing in it. So I appreciate uh, people that ask things. But what we've talked about here, we've, we've gone through this a little bit already. We talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, um, I told you the other day, that in there when it's taught, in fact, let's just start right there for a minute. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Let me just start from that spot and tell you something. In 1 Corinthians 10, I told you that um, in verse number 12, it says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he stand take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you'll be able to bear it. And, um, and when I look at this, um, the, the four things that take place before he says this, he talks about in verse 7, he's, he refers back to a time when there was a delay, and that caused the people to trip up. And then in verse number 9, he talks about a discouragement that they went through that caused them to trip up. In verse number 10, he talked about a disbelief that they had that caused them to trip up because of difficulty. But the one in verse number 8, it was their own desires and they got involved in fornication, and that's what caused them to trip up. And this is, this is what, that in verse 7, 8, 9, and 10, he lists some things that cause people in the Old Testament to trip up and says, you need to be careful and think about this yourself, or else you'll trip up, and you'll end up messing yourself up. And he says, there's no temptation taking you, but it's just common. And so if, 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 think about this for a minute, what is commonly the thing that messes you up in life It'll be delay, God's not moving fast enough, or it'll be discouragement you go through, or it will be disbelief, can God really take care of me during a pandemic? Uh, it'll be those things are the things that will trip you up. Well, the thing that also trips up a lot of Christians is their desires, their, their, their lusts. And, uh, and it was a good question somebody asked me today just about, you know, when it comes to that, if God put desires in us, why is it wrong to just fulfill those, what, those desires? Well, just like anything in life, everything has to be done in order. Everything has to be done the way God says to do it. Okay, so God creates a garden and creates all these trees and says, you can eat anything you want to eat except for that one right there. You know what he says? You have to be obedient to me. And so he wants you to live a life in obedience. He wants you to live a life in subjection to what he wants and what he asks you to do. Because his way is the best way. So he asks us to do it his way. Uh, and so um, I, the, the question that was asked today, I just was typing an answer. It's a good question, really good question. I was typing an answer and it just came to me, you know, if, if you know what my desire is in life? To eat just crazy food, whatever I want, and chase it down with a gallon of ice cream. That's my desire in life. You know what my desire in life is? To sit on the couch and do absolutely nothing but maybe watch Andy Griffith reruns. While I'm eating bluebell ice cream that's dripping off my chin onto my lap. That's, that's the way I'd live my life. You know what? If I lived my life like that, down the road I'd be broke because I'd never work because I'd just be sitting at the house watching TV. And I, would be, I wouldn't be able to move out of the house because I'd be so overweight. You say, well, but, but shouldn't I just be able to just do whatever my desire is? Didn't God put a desire in for, for sweets and for good things and to be able to sit back and enjoy things? Yes, but you do have to do it the right way. If you don't, then it'll be out of hand and cause you more harm, right? Amen? Yes, sir. Amen. Same thing about your lusts. My wife and I, as of yesterday, been married 28 years as of yesterday, 28 years desire towards a husband and wife is a good thing. It's a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing. And God created it to be that way. It has to be within the parameters of what God sets. Outside the parameters. See, the world is living outside the parameters of what God sets. And the world's saying, that's okay because it's just natural. Well, the Bible says that before we got saved, we were natural. After we got saved, we are spiritual. So we've got to live in a spiritual way. 
All right, so let's look at Ephesians chapter number 2. We're going to talk about how to break the chains of this. This is common to man. Everybody's dealing with these same issues. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. In fact, I showed you this morning, the greatest Christian ever lived outside of Jesus Christ said in Romans chapter 7 that the word revealed in him, revealed to him that it was wrong to covet. And covet encompasses more than just money. He said covet in, in, uh, in Exodus has to do with covering my neighbor's wife. And then he went a step further and said that the word revealed sin in me when it showed me that I had all manner of concupiscence. Paul said, I had all manner of irregular sexual lust within me that had to be dealt with. If the greatest man in the Bible outside of Jesus Christ had to deal with lusts, then so do you. And if the greatest man in the Bible wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse number 27, I have to bring my body under subjection, lest while I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Meaning if I don't bring my body, into, if I don't live in obedience and just do whatever my desire is, I will mess myself up, wreck myself. If the greatest man in the Bible says the Word of God revealed that I have all manner of irregular lust in me, and the greatest man in the Bible said I've got to keep that under subjection, then guess what? So do you. Listen, if the strongest man in the Bible, which was who? Some of these kids. Who's the strongest man? Samson. What brought down Samson? A, a female, a woman. It's all women. Gosh, it's all, I knew it was always going to come back to that. No, it's not. It's, but it is this. His desires, his lusts. If that brought down the strongest man, what brought down the wisest man, the smartest man? Who was it? Solomon. It was lusts. What brought down the man after God's own heart, the most spiritually connected man? His lust. Folks, listen, we're dealing with something that is common to man. And not just man, but women. It's something that's common, and everybody's dealing with it. The issue is nobody ever talks about the fact they're dealing with it, but everybody's dealing with it, and we've got to learn how to break the chains of these things. Listen, it's one thing to stand up and say, it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong, and most of you would walk out of here going, I already knew it was wrong before I ever went to church tonight. What we've got to learn how to do is how to beat it. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit tonight. All right, so the first slide. Bring me the first slide up, and, uh, and we'll go through this. Breaking the chains of immorality. First one, the first thing you got to do is you must know who you were and you must know who you are. The first, the first thing you must know is who you were. So you must be saved. There's a, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, watch what it says. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past ye walked past tense, according to the course of this world, according to the prince and the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So think about this now. You used to walk, you used to be dead in your trespasses and your sins. You used to walk according to the course of this world. The course this world is on. This world says it's okay to do all these things. That's the course we used to be on. That's who you used to be. According to the prince and power of the air. Who is that? Say it. Who is it? Satan, that's the devil. You used to, work, you used to walk just the way the devil told you to work. You used to have the spirit in you that is now the same spirit that's in the children of what? Disobedience. Remember what I said? Listen, if you're going to live a life that's going to be spiritually healthy, it's going to have to be a life that is in obedience. Listen, if you want to live a life that's spirit, that is physically healthy, you know what you're going to have to do? Subject yourself and bring yourself in obedience to whatever a trainer tells you to do, whatever those weights you've got to put on you. You have got to bring yourself in it. You can't just have the weights in the room and stare at them every day. I Believe me, it don't work. You've got to get in the exercise and begin doing something with it. The same thing's true with this. You used to be doing some things. You used to just be obedient to whatever the body told you to do. That's what you did. Whatever the mind told you to do, that's what you did. But now, you've got to bring yourself into a new course. I'm obedient to Christ. The children of disobedience, among whom also we all, this is common to man, we all had our conversation. That's the way we used to carry ourselves. In times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh. Think about it now. The lust of 
our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature. Somebody says, well, it's just natural to be this way. The children of wrath, even as others. Yes, this world fornicates like crazy. This world looks at pornography like crazy. This world says it's okay. This world says hey, any type of, of sexuality is just okay. The world says it's all okay. God says it's not all okay. There are some parameters that it has to be under. And so what you need to realize is, as a child of God, as a saved person, you are not who you used to be. Now, if you're, not, if you're not saved, that was a great song you just picked, by the way. I'm not who I used to be. It's under the blood. You've got to realize you are not who you used to be. Somebody says, well, I'm accepted. That's why I put this, this little quote that I kept with a while ago on here. Understand that your old life of sin was unacceptable. Somebody says, yeah, but I'm accepted in Christ. Yes, Christ accepted you, but He did not accept your sin. In fact, He had to pay for your sin. Somebody says, well, I'm just accepted, I'm loved. Yes, you're accepted. Yes, you're loved, which is the next point down. Yes, you're accepted. Yes, you're loved. Yes, you're sealed. Yes, all those things are true. But God did not love your sin. He had to pay for your sin. Let me say amen to that. He had to pay for your sin. Yes, He accepted you and loved you. But that love came with Him suffering the punishment for your sin in your place. God says, yes, you're welcome in, but he, somebody had to pay the penalty for the sin. You're, you are welcome in here with me. Your sin's not. So you've got to think like this. Now listen, you've got to get your mind, which is going to be the next point down, you've got to get your mind thinking the way God thinks about sin. You must know who you were. Go to the next slide. And you must know who you are. According to, that's Ephesians 2, but Ephesians 1, you've heard me say this a million times over, but in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 3, you are blessed. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 4, you are chosen. In, in verse number 5, you are adopted to be His children. In, in numbers 6, you are accepted in Him. In verse number 7, you have been redeemed. Uh, in verse number 11, you have an inheritance. In verse number 12, 13, and 14, you are sealed unto the day of redemption. In chapter 2, in verse number uh, 10, you are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Listen, you have got everything you need. Listen, you are a new creature in Christ Jesus. You know what you need to get a hold of? There's, this is what you've got to get your mind thinking like. The old me that used to act and do and just follow whatever my lusts were, that's the old me, and Christ had to pay for that. The new me is a new creature that is blessed and accepted and loved. And listen, and you have everything, listen now, you have everything at your disposal for you to be a productive, clean, holy, righteous Christian for the Lord Jesus Christ. You have everything you need. I don't need a second blessing of any type. All I need is I need to tap into what I rightfully have as a child of God. I've got to submit myself to who I am in Christ. Who you are. I wrote down some verses there, but in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life that I now, which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. So listen, I am, my old life, the way I used to be, is crucified. And now my life is lived for the one that died for me. Now, folks, that's the problem that most people have got. You want to live your life for you. Your life's not for you anymore. Your life is lived for Him. Now, that's where you're going to have the major problems you're going to have with this idea of fornication and immorality and pornography is you are going to satisfy, try to satisfy what you want. Listen, it's not for you. This body's not for me anymore. This body's a living sacrifice for Him now. You say, well, I, I didn't read the fine print when I got saved. I didn't realize. I just wanted to get out of hell. I didn't realize that He bought me with the, or the price. Well, welcome to the fine print. You have been bought with a price. You belong to Him. You need to know who you are. 
You need to get your mind wrapped around who you are. Romans 6, 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Now, folks, what about that do we not understand? It's real clear. The Bible's very, very clear. The problem is, just like I said this morning, what happens is the Bible shows us something about ourselves. It, sh it reveals what sin is. It reveals where sin is. It's in me. All that stuff is there. And then we say, I don't like it. I don't want it. I don't want to submit myself to that. But folks, that's who you are. Now, flip to the next slide. This is something you need to get. The more you affirm who you are in Christ the more your behavior will begin to reflect your identity. The more you start to say this, listen, the more, the more you guys will get a hold of this, the more you will start to realize that I am, I, this is who I used to be when I lived this way, but I got saved. I'm a child of God. The, when you used, the more you get, this is not who I am, this is who I was. All that fornication, all that lust, all that stuff that you, you say, well, I'm dealing with it. Yeah, that's the old you. The more you start to affirm, that's not who I am, that's who I was. I am, I am a child of God. I am, uh, I am an heir and joint heir with Christ. I have, I possess everything I need to live the Christian life. The more you start telling yourself that, the more you start becoming that. Folks, listen. I said this, and this all just kind of came to me when I was typing back a, a response to my other day. But if I go into, listen, when I go into exercising, this is the way I do it. This is, this is me. This is, this is me. I'll tell Stacy, I'm going to start running more. And she'll say, oh, okay, great. This, that's wonderful. Good. I want you to be in healthy. I want you to be, be, be healthy. And I'll say this. All right, I need to go to the store and buy some good running shoes. Well, you've got some running shoes. Yeah, but if I get some good ones, some brand new ones, I'll be motivated to get out there and run. And, I, and listen, and I am, right up until they get really dirty, then I'm like, ah, I just foam over there with the other ones. And then I'm like, ah, I'm not going anymore. But, I, but listen, if I start off, listen now, if I start off the exercise program with the thought that I'll give this a try, I'm probably going to fail. I'm probably not going to do it very long. I'm probably going to quit within a week or so. If my mindset is that, I guarantee you what I'm going to do is I'm going to quit after a week or so. But if you start telling yourself, listen, I will not quit. I'm going to do it. I'm going to reach my goal. I'm going to lose this weight. I'm going to get in this health. I'm going to do. If you will put some effort into that and not put a contingency in the plan for failure. You say, well, what if I do fail? Get back up and keep going. But what you've got to do is you've got to get yourself thinking, that's not who I am. Just reaffirm it as much as possible. That's not who I am. This is who I am. Number two, so the next slide down. The first one is knowing who you were and who you are. The second one is this, is you must start renewing your mind with sound truth. You have got to start putting sound truth into your life and then submitting yourself to sound truth. In Ephesians chapter number 4, Ephesians has become one of the, my favorite books in the Bible, but in Ephesians chapter 4, look at verse number 11. This is what you need. If you're going to conquer immorality, if you're going to conquer some of these things that are plaguing you in your life, this is what you need. You need more of the truth of God and not less. You need more Bible, not less Bible. You need more of a steady diet from the Word of God, not less. Listen, you need more church, not less church. You need more. You need to be listening to more preaching as you're driving down the road, not less. You need to be listening to more godly music, not less. You need to be listening to more of the Word of God, either listening to it, being read to you or whatever, not less. You need more of the right things in instead of the wrong things. You've got to have the right things in. You've got to start renewing the mind. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 11, And he gave some apostles and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. That's what you've been given pastors and teachers for, verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith 
and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, under the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. And it says in verse 15 that we would grow up into Him. You know what you need? You need a steady dose of the things of God so that you grow up. Listen, when I was a, a child, he says, I spake as a child. When he talked to, to Timothy, he said, you need to flee youthful lusts. You know what some of us need to do? Listen now, you just got to plug in with me for the next 30, 45 minutes. You really got to plug in with me to get this. Some of us need to grow up. We're playing around with sin and playing around with things, and it's time to grow up. It's time to put away childish things. It's time to grow up. And you need more of the Word of God in your life to renew you. You've got to start getting your mind thinking the way God thinks. Look at verse 17 of Ephesians 4. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you henceforth, listen, from now forward, walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. This is the way you think. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Watch. Who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness. That is fleshly lust. Do you see how often this stuff pops up? To work all uncleanness and greediness. Now watch now. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so, be that you have heard Him and have been taught by Him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitfulness, the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now listen, folks, listen. You need to start getting your mind to start thinking about sin the way God thinks about sin. Amen. Everybody listen to me real close. You've got to start getting your mind to start thinking about sin the way God thinks about sin. See, here's the problem that a lot of people have got. You've got a thought about how sin is. It isn't really that big a deal. A little bit's not that big a deal. It's, it's not going to hurt me if I just indulge in a little bit of this stuff. You've got the wrong ideas about sin, and your mind is not lined up with the way God views sin. So you're thinking, well, if I just look at an image, I'm not hurting anybody. God says it's adultery in your heart. So you, we don't think the way God thinks. So you say, well, how do I start thinking the way God thinks? You've got to get your mind lined up with Him. I thought about this verse. I put it up here in Psalm 19. This is a, this is a, a psalm that the psalmist wrote. That's what he says. Who can understand his errors? Watch what he says. Cleanse thou me from secret faults. You know what some of you have got in your life? Secret things that you do. You know what he said? God, help me deal with these secret things. The, the matter is not help me hide my secret things better. The eye is help me deal with my secret errors. My secret faults. Keep back thy servant from presumptuous sin, from just doing things. Let them not have dominion over me. Think about it now. Some of you, your sin is getting dominion over you. Then shall I be upright, and thou shalt be innocent from the great transgression. You know what his prayer was? This is what you need to be praying. God, not help me figure out a way to better cover this up, but God, help me to deal with this. We need to understand the heart of God in these matters. You know, imaginations... You say, well, it's just an imagination. It's nothing wrong with looking at images and having imaginations. You know what the Bible says in Proverbs 6? These six things the Lord hate, yea, seven are abomination to him, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, and a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. You've got to get our mind wrapped around how God views these things. 
In Genesis 6, 5, it says, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. Listen, you've got to get your mind thinking about sin the way God thinks about sin. And you've got to put away from you worldly wisdom. I, I just was trying to do some research, and I thought, let me do some research. Let me read what people think about some of these places. And you go to Romans chapter 1, or you look at, um, I, I think I typed in some stuff about Paul's dealing with lust. I think it's what I may have typed in. And what are some, some commentaries or some thoughts people have about Paul's dealings with lust? And this is what it did. It went through Romans chapter 1, which obviously, folks, listen, you cannot get around Romans chapter 1, that Romans chapter 1 says, obviously, that the degeneration of, of man was that men began to be with men and women began to be with women doing things which were not natural, were not seemly, were not right. And God said that was wrong, right? It's easy to see that. So what people now with philosophy, these people that say they're, they're, that they believe the Bible, what these people are saying now is it didn't really mean homosexuality because God is okay with homosexuality as long as both people are consensual. Obviously, God's okay with that. What, that's, what this is talking about is if you go too far in a thing and then start trying to, to, to show you over here where God said this and try to put it together, and they completely miss the context of what's even in the, the Scripture. Now, you say, what are you saying all that for? I'm saying this because there is a wisdom out there that is worldly that will try to skew every instead of just the plain reading of what the Bible says, try to put it in such a way to make you think my sin is okay. It's okay for me to do what I'm doing. I've even got a guy that says he believes the Bible that said it's okay to do it. In 2 Timothy 4.3, 4, I, I said it this morning, For the time will come where they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. After their own lust. You know what they'll do? Because they have a desire for something, they will gravitate to somebody that will tell them exactly what they want to hear. Amen? Amen. That's what people do. Listen, if, if, if you don't want truth, you're never going to get, listen now, you're never going to get victory in your life over immorality if you won't listen to the hard truths of the Bible. If you want to find a way to skirt the truth, you can find it. So I'm talking about how to break the chains. The way to break the chains, you're going to have to start getting your mind to think like God thinks. In James 3.15, it says, This wisdom, talking about worldly wisdom, this wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, watch, sensual, devilish. Sensual. You know what? There's a wisdom that is all, it's very, it's sensual. It's going towards your senses and your feelings. Folks, this book is not about how you feel. This book is about facts you've got to submit yourself to. Number three, to the next one. I'm talking about how to break it. You've got to start getting your thinking. Make sure you're saved. Remember who you used to be and who you are now. Then start renewing your mind and start thinking the way God wants you to think. In Ephesians 4 and verse number 22, the third thing you've got here is you must start creating new habits and practices. This is a big one. This is a huge one for you. You've got to start creating new habits and practices. In verse number 22, it says that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. You're going to have to put away the deceitful lust. Remember I said what, why was sin deceptive this morning? Because it tells you, oh, it's okay. It makes excuses. You're going to get away with it. It's deceitful. You've got to put away the deceitful lust. In verse number 24, and that you put on the new man. In verse number 25, put away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. And be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole still no more, but rather give. It's all replacing. It's doing things different than the way you used to do them. 
And the idea is you're going to have to start creating new habits. I, this quote, this, this came from a video series that I'd be happy to get for us if you think we can, we can use it here. But this comes from a video series, and it says this, It takes 90 days of sobriety to break the addiction to pornography. It will take three to five years to rebuild the thought patterns of the brain. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. That's what somebody has said about this. Now, I'm sure that's not a hard fact, but that is, that is something somebody has said about it. Let me say this. The idea is this. You have got to break some of the old habits and build new ones is what it's saying. And that's what the Bible says. Renew the mind, get the right things, and then start putting new things in practice and old things, get them out of practice. Now hold your place there and look at Romans chapter 13. I want you to see this one. Because this, like I said, this is one of the key parts of this breaking the chains. Romans chapter 13. And look at verse number 11. Romans 13 and verse number 11. Romans 13 and verse number 11, it says, And that knowing the time that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than we believed. The night is, meaning we're nearer to being with Jesus, is what it's saying, being in heaven. The, the end of this journey is, is nearer than we first. And in verse number 12, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering, which is, again, chambering has to do with immoral sexual behavior, and wantonness, which is a lack of restraint of sexual behavior. It's all right there. Not in strife and envy, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. And watch this next phrase. Make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. This is something you'll have to do if you're going to put new habits in place and get rid of old habits. Listen, if you've got a problem with your tablet, your computer, your phone, whatever the case may be, that that's where you're accessing a lot of this stuff from, you may have to get rid of it. So he says, I don't know that I could live five minutes if I didn't have my Facebook. Well, I'm sure you can figure out a way to get through it. What it will depend on is how bad do you want to beat this? How bad? Listen, I thought about this this morning. People are more concerned about their reputation and how they're viewed by people around them than they are about how God sees them. If you were really concerned about how God, you would do anything you had to do to make sure that you did not do something that was going to be, that was against what God told you to do. It would be, it would be, you would, you, it would be impossible. You would say, I'll do whatever it takes. I just want to be right with my God. And so stop making provision. I was at a conference one time and it was a big conference, tons of people there. And some of these older men were up in the pulpit. And a younger preacher, in fact, it was the same preacher that I said that this morning, got up on the thing and they let him, he let him put black marks all over him. And then he brought his family up and all his people up there and said, how are they going to feel when they find out what you're doing? And he went through all that. That same preacher stood up and said, I have a question to the older guys who are up there. And said, how do you deal with, how, when you counsel people, how do you deal with, immorality with pornography. How do you deal with it with people? What do you tell people? There was an older man named Tom Williams, older man, and he said, I got one word for you, amputation. And I was thinking, wow, that's, that's pretty bold. But what he meant was, you're going to have to cut some things off in your life. If you have some things, access to you, that is pumping you full of the wrong things, you may have to cut those things off. Now, this is, all this is saying is, how bad do you want to beat this? So, well, I don't really, I'm not really that concerned with beating it. Well, then you won't. I'm not really that concerned with getting in shape. Well, then you won't. I'm, really that, I'm not really that concerned with getting a promotion and doing my best at my job. So I, well, then you won't. I'm not really that concerned with living a holy life. Then you won't. Ephesians chapter 5, look at the, this next one, Ephesians 5, very quickly. 
You're going to have to create some new habits. You're going to have to get rid of some things you know are messing you up. Listen, in everything you do in life, I've given you, I've given you balance, okay? So this is what I've said. Remember who you used to be, but the balance is who you are now. I've given you balance. Renew your mind with the right stuff and stay away from the wrong stuff. Balance. Make new habits. Put off the old and cut off some things from the old and put on the new. Balance. All right, now, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 1. Be ye therefore followers of God and dear children and walk in love as Christ also had loved us and had given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. Listen, verse number 2. Walk in love like Christ. Right? As Christ also loved us, walk with the same type of walk that Christ walked. Now, you say, well, what kind of walk was that? Watch what it says. He hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to who? To God. You know what you need to do with your life? Listen now, this one's, you're not going to like, none of this stuff is stuff people are going to really like. But this is how you beat it. What you're going to have to do is you're going to have to say, my life is not about me and my pleasures. My life is sacrificed to God. Now, look now, this is, listen, this is exactly what this is saying. I, and I hope you all are all listening to this. This is exactly what this is saying. My life is not for me, my life is for God. That's what he's saying. If that's, that's the kind of walk you've got to have. But we might as well just really get in, into this. That's the kind of walk you've got to have. What is it in contrast to? Verse 3. If you had your Bible, you'd see it. But fornication and uncleanness and covetousness, and covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saints, neither filthiness. Listen, that's, listen to what it's saying. Listen to what it's saying. When we live a life that says this, when we live a life that says it's about me, my joys, my pleasure, it's about pleasing me, if that's the mentality we've got, then we're going to do whatever it takes to please me. But if we're living our life with saying, in, listen, here's a contrast. Remember, everything's balanced. Here's the contrast. Here's the one side is this. I'm going to fornication, adultery, uncleanness, lasciviousness, lust. I'll do what I want. At the moment, if I feel like doing it, I'll do it. If it feels good to me, I'll do it. That's the way I live my life, whatever I like. That's what I do. Well, that's, that's one way. And, and the, the other side of it is verse number two. It says Christ didn't live that way. The way, the way Christ lived is the right type of love. See, that's the wrong type of love. The love the world has is this type of love. The world the love does, the, 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 world, the way the world sees love is love is connected with my pleasure. Do you realize, folks, listen, do you realize in marriage, in marriage according to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it's not about you, my spouse, pleasing me. It's about me pleasing my spouse. That's the way intimacy is supposed to be according to the Bible. You may even not have known that. That's what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, that the wife is for the husband, the husband's for the wife, to please them. See, the way you've got marriage set up is, please me, please me, please me, please me. That's this type of love, not that type of love. This type of love, even when it comes to intimacy, is saying, I'm here to please you. You see, we've got the wrong type of thinking about love. And see, you young people, are, are you're, you're getting the internet pumping you into your mind. Listen, all you young people, you're getting stuff pumped into your head with pornography and the stuff you're seeing on, on TV. It's messing up the way you think about love. It's got you thinking that this is love. This ain't love. This side's love. It's got all you messed up. Everybody's messed up about the way they think about love and relationships. If you want to beat this thing, you've got to start saying, I'm sacrificing me. I'm on the altar. I'm sacrificing me. It's not about me being satisfied anymore. It's not about me fulfilling my lusts and my desires and my dreams. It's about, listen, and you can, listen, you can fulfill dreams and desires in Christ. The way we've got it all messed up, the world's telling you, hey, be wonderful, be great, do great things, and we never even let Christ and God into the equation. We never ask God, what is your will for anything? It's all about me, 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 even down to love 
and desires. And I tell you something, some of your marriages, the reason why it's having trouble is because it's a very selfish way of looking at things. Chapter 2, the right type of love. I mean, uh, verse 2 of chapter 5, the right type of love. Chapter 3, the wrong type of love. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, very quickly. Just look over there. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I don't even know if I'm on this anymore. You know what you have to do? Verse number 3, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. I asked a bunch of teenagers one time in a, in a, in a, in a class we were in. I said, how many of you want to know the will of God for your life? Man, all of them, amen. I want to know. I said, here it is. I'm about to give it to you. Get your pens out and get your notebooks out. I'm giving the will of God for your life. Everybody's like, I'm writing it down, preacher. This is going to be good. And I said, here it is, verse number 3. This is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. All right, like, oh. Man, what a trick. That's the will of God for your life. That's the will of God for your life. you got to sacrifice yourself and say, I'm bringing myself, uh, uh, my sanctification, verse number four, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel and vessel in sanctification and honor. Verse five, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. You know who you are? You're somebody that knows God. You know what you are to do? You've got to keep this body under subjection. You've got to sacrifice you. This body, listen, this body now, your body now belongs to God. His little body, getting saved, he belongs to God now. This, this, this life is for God. My type of love I'm supposed to be giving is God's type of love now. It's not the way the world does love. It's not the way the world does intimacy. This is the world's way of doing it, and we're not like the world anymore. We used to be on that course. We're not like that anymore. We've got to now subject ourselves to what he wants, not what I want anymore. And, folks, that's the biggest problem that most of us have got is we're on the throne of our heart, not God. If you were to pull this open, sitting on the throne of our heart, God's not on the throne of our heart. I'm on the throne of my heart. God's kind of in the corner saying, shouting out, I've got the best plan for you. Say, hey, hold on, I'll get to you later. I'm going to do what I want to do right now. And so what Paul had to say, if Paul had to say this, we all have to say this, you're going to have to bring your body into subjection, 1 Corinthians 9, 27. I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. You know what he's saying? I'm going to wreck my life if I don't keep my body under subjection. You know how many preachers out there are in prison today? You know why? Because they couldn't keep their body under subjection. You know how many preachers out there today are no longer preachers and their, 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 their marriage is messed up? You know why their marriage is messed up? Because they couldn't keep their body under, under subjection. You know why some marriages are not working right now in our church and churches everywhere? I called a pastor a while back and I said, man, there's a lot of things that have gone on. I don't understand why things go on like this. And he says, let me tell you something. I preach all over this entire world, really the world. He says, I can tell you it's happening in every church everywhere. It's getting worse and worse and worse. You know why? You know why marriages are failing? Because people will not bring their bodies under subjection. Subjection to what? Subjection to the Word of God. I'll do it my way. I'll do it the way I want to do it. I'm okay. I'll get away with it. No, you won't. Marriage will crumble. You young people will get the wrong idea of what love is in your mind, and you will mess yourself up before you even get started. And so you've got to bring your body into subjection. Next, just next slide, and I'll just let you see it, and then we'll... I'll maybe preach it some other day. You've got to separate from those influences that are corrupting you. I'm just going to say this to you, and you just got to get this. You can hang around with people that will help you feed your lusts and your desires. Or you can hang around with some godly people that will try to provoke you towards Godliness. That's the truth. That last little verse is down there. 
Flee also youthful lust. You know what you need to do? Run away from them. But follow. Remember, everything's balanced. I'm going to run away from this, but I'm going to follow after that. But watch what it says. Follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace. But what's the, what's the next little phrase there? With them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Listen, you know what you need to do? You need to get around some people that are trying to pursue God out of a pure heart. You say, I'm trying to beat immorality. I'm trying to live a clean life. I want to I have a successful marriage. I'd like to be married 28 years. Brother Ron, how long have y'all been married? I'll put you on the spot. Huh? 54 years. I'd like to hit 54 years. You know what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to get around some people that are trying to be right and pure. Listen, I guarantee you, if Brother Ron, 20-something years ago, had started hanging around with some people that wanted to live a loose life, go to the bars, go to the clubs, hang out, do some things they shouldn't be doing, I guarantee you he probably may not be sitting there today saying 54 years. And so the only way you're going to be able to do this successfully, and listen, some of you, listen, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that some of you that have messed this up, that you're just damaged goods go by the wayside. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is this, is that anybody in here that has wrecked themselves this way, you know what they would say to you? They would say everything he's saying is 100% true. Don't let it be. That's what they would say. Don't let this happen to you. You say, well, I have messed up in the past. Then I would say this, get up and start applying everything you just heard tonight. Start applying it now. So what if I mess up next week? Then get up next week and start applying it again next week. You know what I tell people when I counsel this about that? I say, listen, what I want you to do is I want you to get up today, and I want you to begin to live a henceforth life. From right now, I want you to start putting everything in practice in your life and start doing, doing right. And they say, well, what, if I'm gonna, what if I fail again next week? Just like I would I'd tell you about working out. Don't start off with the idea that I'm going to fail. But what if I do fail next week? Then here's my advice to you. When you fall down next week, get up next week. You say, well, I got five days before I messed up again. All right, next time, try to go a little further. You say, well, I got six days. Great. Just keep putting some distance between you and who you used to be. And start living for the Lord. This is something that's common to man. I'm, I'm not trying to beat you up. I'm really trying to help you. We need this. If statistics are right, then a majority of you in this room are dealing with this. And so you need some victory in your life. You need some victory. And this is the way to break the chains. Let's stand to our feet. Lord God, Father, we come to you tonight. Lord, we've got just a, a, a good variety of people in the church tonight. <clears throat> and I know there's, there's youth in here. And somebody would, somebody would think, surely youth aren't having these issues. But Lord, I'm, I'm quite sure that the youth are having these issues. And Lord, I don't want them to start off their lives with a marred view of what love is. And Lord, I pray that you'd help them get real about it. I pray you'd help homes get real about it. Father, I pray you'd help fathers and mothers get real about this. I pray you'd help single men and single women that are here get real about this. Father, I pray we'd have a revival in our hearts of holiness. That we'd begin to think the way you think about sin. And it would become, like you said in Romans 7, exceeding sinful to us. It would become something that we say it's dirty and filthy and ugly and I don't want it around me anymore. Father, I pray you'd please send revival to our church and our hearts and our homes. Do a work tonight. Lord, I've tried to be just as faithful as I can to your word tonight. I pray your Holy Spirit would take the word and use it to help our hearts. 
Help us tonight. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. She's going to play. Why don't you pray tonight? Just find a spot to pray. Just pray. You say, well, I don't have an issue with this. Pray that you don't.